wish you each a blessed rest in Christ. We welcome our visitors. You love. Come at a good time. Last week would not have been a good time. For our visitors, we have a uh, potluck, including our members also. <laughs> and we invite each of you to stay. This quarter we have been studying the book of Galatians. Today we will study the first 14 verses of Galatians chapter 5. We have been uh, studying Galatians as God inspired Paul to record it. We even focusing on sections like paragraphs and headings. So I'd like to begin by asking what heading do you have for Galatians chapter 5, beginning at the top? Do you have a heading for Galatians chapter 5? Christian Liberty. Christian Liberty. Sounds like a new King James. Any other headings? The Privileges of Christian Liberty. The Privileges of? Christian Liberty. Christian Liberty. Okay. Anyone else? Christ has made us free. Christ has made us free. Yes. Liberty and freedom are synonymous, aren't they? Anyone else? One version is walk in the spirit. The word walk is uh, comes from the old English language of 1611 when the King James was translated. So it doesn't mean physically, you know, like we walk. It means a way of life. May your way of life be in the Spirit. Two weeks ago, we concluded our study of uh, Galatians chapter 4, the last uh, few verses. And we learned that it was God's original purpose to bring Israel, yes, out of Egypt, but once they crossed the Red Sea, it was His original plan to bring Israel directly to Mount Zion. And we even looked at and read uh, a very interesting song recorded in Exodus 15, 1-21. It's called the Song of Moses and Israel. We then went to Isaiah 35, verse 10, and Isaiah 51, verse 10 and 11, and we made the connection between the Song of Moses and Israel and God's purpose to bring them directly to Mount Zion and not to Mount Sinai. But Israel quit singing that song. And when they stopped singing the song, what happened? They forgot how God had led them. Out of Egypt, across the Red Sea, dry Red Sea. And they began murmuring. We would call it today complaining. I touched on that very briefly, Exodus 15, 22 through 25. So that forced God to change his plans. What forced God to change his plans from taking Israel directly to Mount Zion and instead he took them to Mount Sinai? What changed what forced God to change his plans? Sinful unbelief. They wouldn't allow his law to be written here. Yes. Well, they were also still accustomed to the idolatry that they had, and they had not given that up completely. Some people have suggested that God made a mistake. He was a little too quick. 
He expected too much from them. But Numbers chapter 1 verse 1 tells us that God decided to take two years, one month, and one day to bring Israel after they crossed the Red Sea. What was he trying to do in that two years, one month, and one day? Make them understand that there was only one God. He is their God and no other God. It's true that they had been enslaved in Egypt for 430 years. And I'm sure that God was aware of that. I'm not being sarcastic. But in that two years, two months, one month and one day, he provided a cloud over them in the daytime to protect them from the... Have you ever been in the desert? I mean, a real desert. I'm from California. I've been in the desert. Right, Dan? Yeah. Is it a little bit warm there in the Mojave Desert? A little bit. And the Death Valley? You can see the salt flying on your skin. Yeah. So he provided them cloud over the day, over them in the day, to protect them from the sun. Have you ever been in the desert in the nighttime? It gets cool. He provided them with what? Fire over them. Keep them warm. What else did he do? He had a catering service for them. Fresh water, food. But they decided that that wasn't convincing enough. <laughs> yeah, going back to Exodus 34, 13. But you shall destroy your altars, break their sacred pillars, and cut down their wooden images. For you shall worship no other god but the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they play a harlot with their gods and make sacrifice to their gods. And one of them invites you when you eat of his sacrifice. This was, of course, after they had arrived. Yes. So, we learn from the last two verses of Galatians chapter 4 something very interesting. Remember Galatians chapter 4, 30 and 31? Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman will not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we're not children of the bondwoman, but of the free woman. So, that allegory plays itself out with these two words, bondwoman and the free woman. Who is the son of the bondwoman? And what does Ishmael symbolically represent? Human works. Yes. The works of the flesh. And that is what Galatians is all about. The entire book is about one issue. Not how, whether we should keep the law, whether we should be good, but how to do it. <laughs> Is it your will that God's will be done in your life? If it is, let's take a look at Romans 8, 19 to 21. Volunteer to read Romans 8, 19 to 21. And I need a volunteer for 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. If you'd like to find out what God is going to do to the flesh. For those that have given permission. Okay? Who would like to read Romans 8, 19 to 21 for us? Okay, Phil? For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in the hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption 
into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Isn't that beautiful? So we know that the corruption is going to be what? Delivered. Through whom? Through the sons of who? Children of God. God is still waiting to deliver us. To where? Another Mount Sinai or Mount Zion? Mount Zion. Okay. Now how is God going to take care of this flesh of mine? Who has 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18? Which one is it? 2 Corinthians? 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. self-dependent instead of God-dependent, what happened to the human race? We became totally helpless. God understands that. He's looking for a people that will learn to accept that. And the day He does, He'll take us to where? Mount Zion. Lois? So are we spiritually half dead? We're flesh, but we're not spiritual. Well, where is the Holy Spirit right now? In us. It should be with us. No, we kick, it's no longer part of our standard equipment. We kicked it out in the Garden of Eden. Well, what is the name that Jesus uses for the Holy Spirit? The Greek word is parakletos, where we get parallel, P-A-R-A. Kletos is helper, P-A-R-A is right here, right next to us. And all you have to do is what? Oing. Invite him to take over, and what does he do? He takes over. But when we invite him, he has the invitation has to be 100 percent Do we understand that? That's the issue. That's the issue. There is no other issue. So this biblical truth that we're discussing here guarantees victory over what? How many sins? Because it means that we are focusing on God's promises to us rather than our old covenant promises to Him. That's the issue of the book of Galatians. Eve decided in the Garden of Eden, you know what? This serpent is right. It's unfair for God to not allow me to know all that there is to know about sin. So what did she say? I need more. <laughs> what God has done for us in the Garden of Eden is very nice, but it's not enough. I need more. And that's what we do. When we do not allow the Holy Spirit to take over 100%, we say, no, I need to keep a little bit for me. Let's begin our study of Galatians chapter 5 which is really topically a continuation of chapter 4. We're still talking about liberty, freedom, but bondage. So, I would like to suggest that to begin our study of Galatians chapter 5, we go to Luke chapter 4, 18, and read Jesus' first words after he has been baptized, tempted by Satan, and now he begins his mission to redeem you and me. Luke 4.18, which is a quotation from uh, Isaiah 61, verse 1. Who would like to read for us, okay, Mary Jane? 
Luke 4, 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, <laughs> to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. To set at liberty those that are what? Captive. Do you think that there's a relationship between the miracles that Jesus performed, healing people physically, and the spiritual healing? Who would like to read verses 10 to 13 of Luke uh, chapter uh, 13? Luke 13, verses 10 to 13. Sabbath day, and a synagogue official really became indignant, really, really, really upset. Who would like to read verses 15 and 16 of Luke 13? Diane? The Lord then answered him and said, Hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it? So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? Thank you. So our lesson is talking about bondage and freedom and liberty. That's what Galatians 5 is all about. So I wanted to go back to this incident and first experience of Jesus in his ministry to redeem us. To see how there is a relationship between the miracles that Jesus performed and solving this issue of liberty and freedom. It has to do with liberty and freedom from our infirmities, physically, but it also has to do with the spiritual condition that all of us have need to be what? Cured from. And this is our condition before we meet Jesus. Are we bound by Satan? And I'm not talking about physical ailments. Are we bound by Satan to keep us from doing God's will and doing Satan's will? Let's take a look at Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.26. Who would like to read that for us? 2 Timothy 2.26. Okay, Mary Jane. And that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. So, the issue is very, very clear. We are in bondage, and we're captives of Satan. We have a choice to become a slave to Christ, or we have a choice to become a slave to Satan. Paul is very clear about that in Romans 6.16. Very, very clear. Those are our choices. We either be choose to become a slave to Christ or to Satan. That's it. 
There is no in-between. There's no neutral area here. Jesus says, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. John 8, 34. And when we speak of the word sin here, we need to be careful students of the Bible. The word sin in the Bible is used two ways. Speaking of my condition as an adjective or a noun sometimes, and also as a verb. Jesus came to take care of my condition. Because once he takes care of my condition, he automatically stops the what? The verbs. Do we understand that? George Knight calls that sin capital all letters and then sin little letters. The condition is sin all caps. In 1 John 3, 8, Jesus inspires the Apostle John to say, He who commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose was the Son of God manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Did Jesus accomplish that, yes or no? Yes. <laughs> Proverbs 5.22 says that sin is the cord that Satan uses to bind us. Very, 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 very visual. Are we today like that lady in Luke 13, bound by a spirit of infirmity? Can we free ourselves on our own? What is the biblical solution? Romans 5, 6. While I was helpless and ungodly, Jesus came and did what for me? How did Jesus do this ethically and legally? Because that is the key question in the Christian world. Okay, let's go to scripture because I've read books that say I need to be careful here. <laughs> I need to be very careful. Is sin sin, period. I need three volunteers. One to read Matthew 8, 16 and 17. One to read Hebrews 2. Volunteer for Matthew 8, 16 and 17. Volunteer. Okay, right here, Diana. And a volunteer for Hebrews 2, 17. Okay, Lois. And a volunteer for Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. We need to look at these verses. Okay, great. We need to understand these verses very, very carefully. <clears throat> they are very, very clear. We need to understand what God is trying to communicate here to us. Matthew 8, 16, and 17. When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. And he cast out the spirits with a word, and healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Who is the he? Jesus. And what did he take on? Does that make Jesus a sinner? No. The key word there is T-O-O-K. Upon his sinless divine nature, he took on my sinful nature. That's the only way that he could ethically and legally save us, folks. Do we understand that? So he took my penalty that I should have taken, and he took it upon himself. Even though I was the sinner, he was sinless. Yes, that's the result. Why did Jesus ask John the Baptist 
who was reluctant to baptize him when Jesus says, I'm here. I can be baptized by you. And what did John say? What? What are you talking about? I'm not worthy to carry your sandals. You want me to baptize you? What did Jesus say in Matthew 3.15? We need to do this for what reason? All what? Righteousness. Righteousness. Very important word. You need to understand that word because it's used nine different ways in the New Testament. But they fall into three main categories. Unless you understand the three main categories, you have no clue what is being saved when you come across the word righteousness. So, he took on what? Our infirmities. Okay? Other translations say weaknesses. Beautiful. Who has Hebrews 2.17? Over here, folks. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Thank you. The word propitiation means sacrifice. In Greek, the word had to be made is he was obligated. What does the word obligated mean? It's not an option, right? He was obligated legally to what? Take on my what? Well, folks, we're talking grammar here, okay? We're not interpreting anything or speculating. This is grammar. Now, this is the big one. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Do you know people that have made a bad choice in life? And they're reluctant to come to Jesus because they say, what? Oh, I've messed up so bad. How do I dare even, you know, show my face in church? Do you know people like that? I've had that thought. You really messed up, Chuck. How can you dare even speak to Christ? Well, once I understood uh, verse uh, 15 that says what? We do not have a high priest that cannot identify with our what? Infirmity. infirmity. Do you know what the Greek word for infirmity is? Asthenia. And it has two meanings. It's either speaking of physical infirmity or deformed in some way. Was Jesus missing an ear or an eye or an arm or a leg? No. He says it was a perfect, what, Lamb of God. The other usage for the word asthenia or infirmities in Hebrews 4.15 is... Moral weakness. Woo! Weak. Some people just fall back on that one. Say, no way that he had what? Moral weaknesses. Well, what does the Bible say? Yes, he did. Why? Because he could not have ethically and legally saved me had he not taken on his sinless and divine nature, my sinful nature, infirmities. Again, we're talking grammar. I know that this is massaged by people, especially scholars. But if we stick with the grammar, it's very, very clear. It's very, very clear. Do you have any questions about this? Because this is Satan's masterpiece of deception. That Jesus did not identify with us at the incarnation as far as taking on my sinful, rotten nature. Good. So the NLT says this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. That's the word you just heard, referred to uh, our, our sins. Our, our... If you were to translate that yourself, how would you translate that? Well, to begin with, what does the word understand mean? Is it speaking of my body or is it speaking of my brain? Oh, I understand this. Which is, what does the word understand suggest? Is it speaking of here, or is it speaking of 
wait. He took upon his sinless divine nature, my sinful nature. He took it on. He didn't say, oh, we have this problem here in planet Earth. We have Chuck the sinner. So how are we going to help Chuck out? Well, you know, let's tell him that we love him and that he'll forgive us of his sins and he's really genuinely demonstrate 